Hi guys, I'm back to read from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And today I am going to read chapters 25 to 27. Chapter 25 is called The Great Glass Elevator. I've never seen anything like it, cried Mr. Wonka. The children are disappearing like rabbits. But you mustn't worry about it. They'll all come out in the wash. Mr. Wonka looked at the little group that stood beside him in the corridor. There were only two children left now, Mike TV and Charlie Bucket. And there were three grown-ups, Mr. and Mrs. TV and Grandpa Joe. Shall we move on? Mr. Wonka asked. Oh, yes, cried Charlie and Grandpa Joe both together. My feet are getting tired, said Mike TV. I want to watch television. If you're tired, then we'd better take the elevator, said Mr. Wonka. It's over here. Come on, in we go. He skipped across the passage to a pair of double doors. The doors slid open. The two children and the grown-ups went in. Now then, cried Mr. Wonka, which button shall we press first? Take your pick. Charlie Bucket stared around him in astonishment. This was the craziest elevator he'd ever seen. There were buttons everywhere. The walls and even the ceiling were covered all over with rows and rows and rows of small black push buttons. There must have been a thousand of them on each wall and another thousand on the ceiling. And now Charlie noticed that every single button had a tiny printed label beside it, telling you which room you would be taken to if you pressed it. This isn't just an ordinary up and down elevator, announced Mr. Wonka proudly. This elevator can go sideways and long ways and slant ways and any other way you can think of. It can visit any single room in the whole factory, no matter where it is. You simply press the button and zing, you're off. Fantastic, murmured Grandpa Joe. His eyes were shining with excitement as he stared at the rows and rows of buttons. The whole elevator is made of thick, clear glass, Mr. Wonka declared. Walls, doors, ceiling, floor, everything is made of glass so that you can see out. But there's nothing to see, said Mike TV. Choose a button, said Mr. Wonka. The two children may press one button each, so take your pick. Hurry up. In every room, there's something delicious and wonderful. Something delicious and wonderful is being made. Quickly, Charlie started reading some of the labels along the buttons. The rock candy mine, 10,000 feet deep, it said on one. Coconut ice skating rinks, it said on another. Then, strawberry juice water pistols. Toffee apple trees for planting out in your garden, all sizes. Exploding candy for your enemies. Luminous lollies for eating in bed at night. Mint jujubes for the boy next door. They'll give him green teeth for a month. Cavity filling caramels. No more dentists. Stick jaw for talkative parents. Wig wriggle sweets that wriggle delightfully in your tummy after swallowing. Invisible chocolate bars for eating in, in class. Candy-coated pretzels for sucking. Fizzy lemonade swimming pools. Magic hand fudge. When you hold it in your hand, you taste it in your mouth. Rainbow drops. Suck them and you can spit in six different colors. Come on, come on, cried Mr. Wonka. We can't wait all day. Isn't there a television room in all this lot? Asked Mike TV. Certainly there's a television room, said Mr. Wonka. That button over there. He pointed with his finger. Everybody looked. Television chocolate, it said on the tiny label beside the button. Whoopee, shouted Mike TV. That's for me. He stuck out his thumb and pressed the button. Instantly, there was a tremendous whizzing noise. The doors clanged shut and the elevator leaped away as though it had been stung by a wasp. But it leapt sideways. And all the passengers, except Mr. Wonka, who was holding on to a strap from the ceiling, were flung off their feet onto the floor. Get up, get up, cried Mr. Wonka, roaring with laughter. But just as they were staggering to their feet, the elevator changed direction and swerved violently around the corner. And over they went once more. Help, shouted Mrs. TV. Take my hand, madam, said Mr. Wonka gallantly. There you are. Now grab this strap. Everybody grab a strap. The journey's not over yet. Old Grandpa Joe staggered to his feet and caught hold of a strap. Little Charlie, who couldn't possibly reach as high as that, put his arms around Grandpa Joe's legs and hung on tight. The elevator rushed, at, at, rushed on at the speed of a rocket. 
Nat was beginning to climb. It was shooting up and up and up on a steep, slanty course as if it were climbing a very steep hill. Then suddenly, as though it had come to the top of the hill and gone over a precipice, it dropped like a stone. Charlie felt his tummy coming right up into his throat, and Grandpa Joe shouted, Yippee! Here we go! And Mrs. TV cried out, The rope is broken! We're going to crash! And Mr. Wonka said, Calm yourself, my dear lady, and patted her comfortably on the arm. And then Grandpa Joe looked down at Charlie, who was clinging to his legs, and, and he said, Are you all right, Charlie? Charlie shouted, I love it! It's like a roller coaster! And through the glass walls of the elevator, as it rushed along, they caught sudden glimpses of strange and wonderful things going on in some of the other rooms. An enormous spout with brown, sticky stuff oozing out of it onto the floor. A great craggy mountain made entirely of fudge with Oompa Loompas, all roped together for safety, hacking huge chunks of fudge out of its sides. A machine with white powder spraying out of it like a snowstorm. A lake of hot caramel with steam coming off it. A village of Oompa Loompas with tiny houses and streets and hundreds of Oompa Loompa children no more than four inches high playing in the streets. And now the elevator began flattening out again, but it seemed to be going faster than ever. And Charlie could hear the scream of the wind outside as it hurtled, hurtled forward. And it twisted and it turned and it went up and it went down and... I'm going to be sick, yelled Mrs. TV, turning green in the face. Please don't be sick, said Mr. Wonka. Try and stop me, said Mrs. TV. Then you'd better take this, said Mr. Wonka. And he swept his magnificent top hat off his head and held it out upside down in front of Mrs. TV's mouth. Make this awful thing stop, ordered Mr. TV. Can't do that, said Mr. Wonka. It won't stop till we get there. I only hope no one's using the other elevator at this moment. What other elevator, screamed Mrs. TV. The one that goes the opposite way on the same track as this one, said Mr. Wonka. Holy mackerel, cried Mr. TV. You mean we might have a collision? I've always been lucky so far, said Mr. Wonka. Now I am going to be sick, yelled Mrs. TV. No, no, said Mr. Wonka, not now. We're nearly there. Don't spoil my hat. The next moment there was screaming of brakes and the elevator began to slow down. Then it stopped altogether. Some ride, said Mr. TV, wiping his great sweaty face with a handkerchief. Never again, gasped Mrs. TV. And then the doors of the elevator slid open and Mr. Wonka said, Just a minute now, listen to me. I want everybody to be very careful in this room. There's dangerous stuff around in here and you must not tamper with it. Chapter 26, The Television Chocolate Room. The TV family, together with Charlie and Grandpa Joe, stepped out of the elevator and into a room so dazzling bright and dazzling white that they screwed up their eyes in pain and stopped walking. Mr. Wonka handed each of them a pair of dark glasses and said, Put these on quick and don't take them off in here, whatever you do. This light could blind you. As soon as Charlie had his dark glasses on, he was able to look around him in comfort. He saw a long, narrow room. The room was painted white all over. Even the floor was white, and there wasn't a speck of dust anywhere. From the ceiling, huge lamps hung down and bathed the room in a brilliant blue-white light. The room was completely bare except for at the far ends. At one of these ends, there was an enormous camera on wheels, and a whole army of Oompa Loompas was clustering around it, oiling its joints and adjusting its knobs and polishing its great glass lens. The Oompa Loompas were all dressed in the most extraordinary way. They were wearing bright red spacesuits, complete with helmets and goggles. At least they looked like spacesuits. And they were working in complete silence. Watching them, Charlie experienced a queer sense of danger. There was something dangerous about this whole business, and the Oompa Loompas knew it. There was no chattering or singing among them here, and they moved about over the huge black camera slowly and carefully in their scarlet spacesuits. At the other end of the room, about 50 paces away from the camera, <clears throat> a single Oompa Loompa, also wearing a spacesuit, was sitting at a black table gazing at the screen of a very large television set. Here we go, cried Mr. Wonka, hopping up and down with excitement. This is the testing room for my very latest and greatest invention. 
television chocolate. But what is television chocolate? asked Mike TV. Good heavens, child, stop interrupting me, said Mr. Wonka. It works by television. I don't like television myself. I suppose it's all right in small doses, but children never seem to be able to take it in small doses. They want to sit there all day long, staring and staring at the screen. That's me, said Mike TV. Shut up, said Mr. TV. Thank you, said Mr. Wonka. I shall now tell you how this amazing television set of mine works. But first of all, do you know how ordinary television works? It is very simple. At one end, where the picture is being taken, you have a large movie camera and you start photographing something. The photographs are then split up into millions of tiny little pieces which are so small that you can't see them. And these little pieces are shot out into the sky by electricity. In the sky, they go whizzing around all over the place until suddenly they hit the antenna on the roof of somebody's house. They then go flashing down the wire that leads right into the back of the television set. And in there, they get jiggled and joggled around until at last, every single one of those millions of tiny pieces is fitted back into its right place. Just like a jigsaw puzzle. And presto, the photograph appears on the screen. That isn't exactly how it works, my TV said. I'm a little deaf in my left ear, Mr. Wonka said. You must forgive me if I don't hear everything you say. I said that isn't exactly how it works, shouted Mike TV. You're a nice boy, Mr. Wonka said, but you talk too much. Now then, the first time I saw ordinary television working, I was struck by a tremendous idea. Look here. I shouted, if these people can break up a photograph into millions of pieces and send the pieces whizzing through the air and then put them together again at the other end, why can't I do the same thing with a bar of chocolate? Why can't I send a real bar of chocolate whizzing through the air in tiny pieces and then put the pieces together at the other end, all ready to be eaten? Impossible, said Mike TV. You think so? Said Mr. Wonka, cried Mr. Wonka. Well, watch this. I shall now send a bar of my very best chocolate from one end of this room to the other by television. Get ready there. Bring in the chocolate. Immediately, six Oompa Loompas marched forward, carrying on their shoulders the most enormous bar of chocolate Charlie had ever seen. It was about the size of the mattress he slept on at home. It has to be big, Mr. Wonka explained, because wherever you send something by television, it always comes out much smaller than it was when it went in. Even with ordinary television, when you photograph a big man, he never comes out on your screen any taller than a pencil, does he? Here we go then, get ready. No, no, stop, hold everything. You there, Mike TV, stand back. You're too close to the camera. There are dangerous rays coming out of that thing. They could break you up into a million tiny pieces in one second. That's why the Oompa Loompas are wearing spacesuits. The suits protect them. All right, that's better. Now then, switch on. One of the Oompa Loompas caught hold of a large switch and pulled it down. There was a blinding flash. The chocolate's gone, shouted Grandpa Joe, waving his arms. He was quite right. The whole enormous bar of chocolate had disappeared completely into thin air. It's on its way, cried Mr. Wonka. It is now rushing through the air above our heads in a million tiny pieces. Quick. Come over here. He dashed over to the other end of the room where the large television set was standing and the others followed him. Watch the screen, he cried. Here it comes, look. The screen flickered and lit up. Then suddenly a bar of chocolate appeared in the middle of the screen. Take it, shouted Mr. Wonka, growing more and more excited. How can you take it? Asked Mike TV laughing. It's just a picture on a television screen. Charlie Bucket, cried Mr. Wonka. You take it. Reach out and grab it. Charlie put out his hand and touched the screen, and suddenly, miraculously, the bar of chocolate came away in his fingers. He was so surprised he nearly dropped it. Eat it, shouted Mr. Wonka. Go on and eat it. It'll be delicious. By the time... I'm sorry. It's the same bar. It's gotten smaller on its journey, that's all. It's absolutely fantastic, gasped Grandpa Joe. It's, it's, it's a miracle. Just 
imagine, cried Mr. Wonka, when I start using this across the country. You'll be sitting at home watching television, and suddenly a commercial will flash onto the screen, and a voice will say, eat Wonka's chocolates. They're the best in the world. If you don't believe us, try one for yourself. Now! And you simply reach out and take one. How about that, huh? Terrific, cried Grandpa Joe. It will change the world. Thank goodness that's not a real thing because we all know Miss Hunt would be in bad shape if all she had to do was watch the TV to get more chocolate. <laughs> Chapter 27 is called Mike TV is sent by television. Mike TV was even more excited than Grandpa Joe at seeing a bar of chocolate being sent by television. But Mr. Wonka, he shouted, can you send other things through the air in the same way? Breakfast cereal, for instance. Oh, my sainted aunt, cried Mr. Wonka. Don't mention that disgusting stuff in front of me. Do you know what breakfast cereal is made of? It's made of all those little curly wooden shavings you find in pencil sharpeners. But could you send it by television if you wanted to, as you do chocolate? asked Mike TV. Of course I could. And what about people? asked Mike TV. Could you send a real live person from one place to another in the same way? A person? cried Mr. Wonka. Are you off your rocker? But could it be done? Good heavens, child, I really don't know. I suppose it could. Yes, I'm pretty sure it could. Of course it could. I wouldn't like to risk it, though. It might have some very nasty results. But Mike TV was already off and running. The moment he heard Mr. Wonka saying, I'm pretty sure it could. Of course it could. He turned away and started running as fast as he could towards the other end of the room where the great camera was standing. Look at me, he shouted as he ran. I'm going to be the first person in the world to be sent by television. No, 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 cried Mr. Wonka. Mike, screamed Mrs. TV, stop, come back. You'll be turned into a million tiny pieces. But there was no stopping Mike TV now. The crazy boy rushed on, and when he reached the enormous camera, he jumped straight for the switch, scattering Oompa Loompas right and left as he went. See you later, alligator, he shouted, and he pulled down the switch. And as he did so, he leapt out into the full glare of the mighty lens. There was a blinding flash. Then there was silence. Then Mrs. TV ran forward, but she stopped dead in the middle of the room, and she stood there. She stood staring at the place where her son had been, and her great red mouth opened wide, and she screamed, He's gone! He's gone! Great heavens, he has gone! shouted Mr. TV. Mr. Wonka hurried forward and placed a hand gently on Mrs. TV's shoulder. We shall have to hope for the best, he said. We must pray that your little boy will come out unharmed at the other end. Mike, screamed Mrs. TV, clasping her head in her hands. Where are you? I'll tell you where he is, said Mr. TV. He's whizzing around above our heads in a million tiny pieces. Don't talk about it, wailed Mrs. TV. We must watch the television set, said Mr. Wonka. He may come through any moment. Mr. and Mrs. TV and Grandpa Joe and little Charlie and Mr. Wonka all gathered around the television and stared tensely at the screen. The screen was quite blank. He's taking a heck of a long time to come across, said Mr. TV, wiping his brow. Oh, dear, oh, dear, said Mr. Wonka. I do hope that no part of him gets left behind. What on earth do you mean? asked Mr. TV sharply. I don't wish to alarm you, said Mr. Wonka, but it does sometimes happen that only about half the little pieces find their way into the television set. It happened last week. I don't know why, but the result was that only half a bar of chocolate came through. Mrs. TV let out a scream of horror. You mean only a half of Mike is coming back to us? She cried. Let's hope it's the top half, said Mr. TV. Hold everything, said Mr. Wonka. Watch the screen. Something's happening. The screen had suddenly begun to flicker. Then some wavy lines appeared. Mr. Wonka adjusted one of the knobs and the wavy lines went away. And now, very slowly, the screen began to get brighter and brighter. 
Here he comes, yelled Mr. Wonka. Yes, that's him, all right. Is he in one piece? cried Mrs. TV. I'm not sure, said Mr. Wonka. It's too early to tell. Faintly at first, but becoming clearer and clearer every second, the picture of Mike TV appeared on the screen. He was standing up and waving at the audience and grinning from ear to ear. But he's a midget, shouted Mr. TV. Mike, cried Mrs. TV. Are you all right? Are there any bits of you missing? Isn't he going to get any bigger? shouted Mr. TV. Talk to me, Mike, cried Mrs. TV. Say something. Tell me you're all right. A tiny little voice, no louder than the squeaking of a mouse, came out of the television set. Hi, Mom, it said. Hi, Pop. Look at me. I'm the first person ever to be sent by television. Grab him, ordered Mr. Wonka. Quick. Mrs. TV shot out a hand and picked up the tiny figure of Mike TV out of the screen. Hooray, cried Mr. Wonka. He's all in one piece. He's completely unharmed. You call that unharmed? snapped Mrs. TV, peering at the little speck of a boy who was now running to and fro across the palm of her hand, waving his pistols in the air. He was certainly not more than an inch tall. He shrunk, said Mr. TV. Of course he shrunk, said Mr. Wonka. What did you expect? This is terrible, wailed Mrs. TV. What are we going to do? And Mr. TV said, we can't send him back to school like this. He'll get trod upon. He'll get squashed. He won't be able to do anything, cried Mrs. TV. Oh, yes, I will, squeaked the tiny voice of Mike TV. I'll still be able to watch television. Never again, shouted Mr. TV. I'm throwing the television set right out the window the moment we get home. I've had enough of television. When he heard this, Mike TV flew into a terrible tantrum. He started jumping up and down on the palm of his mother's hand, screaming and yelling and trying to bite her fingers. I want to watch television, he squeaked. I want to watch television. I want to watch television. I want to watch television. Here, give him to me, said Mr. TV. And he took the tiny boy and shoved him into the breast pocket of his jacket and stuffed a handkerchief on top. Squeals and yells came from inside the pocket and the pocket shook as the furious little prisoner fought to get out. Oh, Mr. Wonka wailed Mrs. TV. How can we make him grow? Well, said Mr. Wonka, stroking his beard and gazing thoughtfully at the ceiling. I must say that's a wee bit tricky. But small boys are extremely springy and elastic. They stretch like men. So what we'll do, we'll put him in a special machine I have for testing the stretchiness of chewing gum. Maybe that'll bring him back to what he was. Oh, thank you said Mrs. TV. Don't mention it, dear lady. How far do you think he'll stretch? asked Mr. TV. Maybe miles, said Mr. Wonka. Who knows? But he's going to be awfully thin. Everything gets thinner when you stretch it. You mean like chewing gum? said Mr. TV. Exactly. How thin will he be? asked Mrs. TV anxiously. I haven't the foggiest idea, said Mr. Wonka. And it really does, it doesn't really matter anyway, because we'll soon fatten him up again. All we'll have to do is give him a triple overdose of my wonderful super vitamin candy. Super vitamin candy contains huge amounts of vitamin A and vitamin B. It also contains vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin F, vitamin G, vitamin I, vitamin J, vitamin K, vitamin L, vitamin N, vitamin N, Vitamin O, vitamin P, vitamin Q, vitamin R, vitamin T, vitamin U, vitamin V, vitamin W, vitamin X, vitamin Y, and believe it or not, vitamin Z. The only two vitamins it doesn't have in it are vitamin S, because that makes you sick, and vitamin H, because it makes you grow horns out of the top of your head like a bull. But it does have in it a very small amount of the rarest and most magical vitamin of them all, vitamin Wonka. And what will that do to him? asked Mr. TV anxiously. It'll make his toes grow out until they're as long as his fingers. Oh no, cried Mrs. TV. Don't be silly, said Mr. Wonka. It's most useful. He'll be able to play the piano with his feet. But Mr. Wonka. No arguments, please, said Mr. Wonka. He turned away and clicked his fingers three times in the air. An Oompa Loompa appeared immediately and stood beside him. 
Follow these orders, said Mr. Wonka, handing the Oompa Loompa a piece of paper on which he had written full instructions, and you'll find the boy in his father's pocket. Off you go. Goodbye, Mr. TV. Goodbye, Mrs. TV. And please don't look so worried. They all come out in the wash, you know, every one of them. At the end of the room, the Oompa Loompas around the giant camera were already beating their tiny drums and beginning to jog up and down to the rhythm. There they go again, said Mr. Wonka. I'm afraid you can't stop them singing. Little Charlie caught Grandpa Joe's hand, and the two of them stood beside Mr. Wonka in the middle of the long, bright room, listening to the Oompa Loompas. And this is what they sang. The most important thing we've learned, so far as children are concerned, is never, never, never let them near your television set. Or better still, just don't install the idiotic thing at all. In almost every house we've been, we watch them gaping at the screen. They loll and slop and lounge about and stare until their eyes pop out. Last week in someone's place we saw a dozen eyeballs on the floor. They sit and stare and stare and sit until they're hypnotized by it, until they're absolutely drunk with all that shocking ghastly junk. Oh yes, we know it keeps them still they don't climb out the window sill. They never fight or kick or punch. They leave you free to cook the lunch and wash the dishes in the sink. But did you ever stop to think, to wonder just exactly what this does to your beloved tot? It rots the senses in the head. It kills imagination dead. It clogs and clutters up the mind. It makes a child so dull and blind. He can no longer understand a fantasy, a fairyland. His brain becomes a soft cheese. His powers of thinking rust and freeze. He cannot think. He only sees. All right, you'll cry. All right, you'll say. But if we take the set away, what shall we do to entertain our dollar, darling children? Please explain. We'll answer this by asking you. What use the darling ones to do? How used do they play them keep themselves contented before this monster was invented? Have you forgotten? Don't you know? We'll say it very loud and slow. They used to read. They'd read and read and read and read and then proceed to read some more. Great Scott Gadzooks, one half of their lives was reading books. The nursery shelves held books galore. Books cluttered up the nursery floor. And in the bedroom by the bed, more books were waiting to be read. Such wondrous, fine, fantastic tales of dragons, gypsies, queens, and whales. And treasure isles and distant shores where smugglers rode with muffled oars. And pirates wearing purple pants and sailing ships and elephants and cannibals crouching round the pot, stirring away at something hot. It smells so good, what can it be? Good gracious, it's Penelope. The younger ones had Beatrice Potter with Mr. Todd, the dirty rotter, and Squirrel Nutkin, Pigling Bland, and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, and just how the camel got his hump, and how the monkey lost his rump. And Mr. Toad, and bless my soul, there's Mr. Rat and Mr. Mole. Oh, books, what books they used to know, those children living long ago. Oh, please, oh, please, we beg, we pray. Go throw your TV set away. And in its place you can install a lovely bookshelf on the wall. Then fill the shelves with lots of books, ignoring all the dirty looks. The screams and yells, the bites and kicks, and children hitting you with sticks. Fear not, because we promise you that in about a week or two of having nothing else to do, they'll now begin to feel the need of having something good to read. And once they start, oh boy, oh boy, you watch the slowly growing joy that fills their hearts. They'll glow so keen, they'll wonder what they'd ever seen in that ridiculous machine. That nauseating, foul, unclean, repulsive television screen. And later, each and every kid will love you more for what you did. P.S. Regarding Mike TV, we very much regret that we 
shall simply have to wait and see if we can get him back his height. But if we can't, it serves him right. You have a quiz over these chapters.